Thank you very much, Ehsan, and, and uh, my thanks to all of you for being here. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's very good of you to spend the time to hear me talk about this book that was published last year, and um, it's been a few years in the making. Uh, let me share my screen with you, if I may. Um, uh, Ehsan, you need to allow me to, part, uh, to do screen sharing. Uh, sorry, just a moment. This sorry. Uh, yep. Yeah, can you try now? Yes. Okay. And can you see this in full screen? Yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, this is the cover of the book. Um, what I'm about to share with you in the next uh, 30 minutes, hopefully even less, is part of what I've been exploring in the past decade in relation to the processes of historical change, but specifically uses of the past in the present, a cultural process that is also known as heritage. I'm particularly interested in developing countries, and this book is of course about Iran, which is a developing country. And the reason for that is that firstly, they provide interesting and important case studies. And secondly, the majority of humanity live in developing parts of the world, and they are therefore exposed to what I call critical historical change. In emphasizing this critical historical change, I'm referring to places where the speed and magnitude of change generate massive social and cultural shifts. As a result, they catalyze transformations that may at times appear anachronistic. The anachronism is most apparent when real or imagined conceptions of the past and its traditions are invoked in various forms, explicitly or otherwise, to render the present legible while responding to uh, identity concerns. These two pictures that you can see and, and, and the presentation will deal with these two. On the left is a scene from uh, 1978, 79 revolution. So this is 1978. Um, in the capital Tehran, the people are out. The other one is 1963, the so-called white revolution, which was a massive suite of reforms uh, produced by then King of Iran, the Shah, uh, uh, about land reforms and the rest of it, which I'll get to. So all of these created those critical changes in every aspect of society. Here, Iran is an interesting case in point, where in the latter part of the 20th century, rapid development and serious concerns for identity were concurrently on the march. It was along that march that the Islamic Revolution of 1979 exploded into the scene with a powerful identitarian agenda and promoted historical change of its own kind. Uh, this is why Iran is an excellent example. It has been a developmental context, undergoing social cultural change, and the magnitude of that change and its effects are perceivable within the intergenerational and generational memories. In fact, the upheaval of 1979 occurred following an unprecedented wave of sustained economic growth, which, as you can see here from 1960 to 1980, uh, you can see how GDP has been growing uh, rapidly uh, compared to uh, this isn't Korea, this is South Korea, of course. Uh, you can see that it was way ahead of South Korea at the time. Now, uh, the reason I put South Korea is that uh, most of the people who lament the revolution, uh, or even those who don't, perhaps, uh, they say that we could have been or we should become as good as Japan or South Korea. Here's the example that how it was. <clears throat> Although this sustained economic growth had peaked with the oil boom early in that decade, the growth was also fueled by economic management and planning cycles devised by state apparatuses uh, since the previous decade. So that is the 1960s. Um, it was also pre preceded by the White Revolution, the state-driven reform measures that I mentioned uh, uh, that were put uh, to a symbolic referendum in 1963. Uh, you might be interested to know under pressure by the American administration. I think it was uh, uh, Kennedy at the time. And uh, they, they did that because they wanted to have uh, a kind of a semblance of democracy in Iran. So uh, I think a very large percentage voted yes, naturally. Together, 
These formed a massive suite of social, economic, and cultural reform programs. Mind you, when I said semblance of democracy, uh, it was positive programs anyway, but from top imposed, if you, if you will. These changes, the white revolution, the economic growth, and the advent of the Islamic revolution that came subsequently, all prompted massive population displacement, unprecedented growth in both urban and French settlements with its concomitant cultural displacement. Displacement and urbanization raised demands for infrastructure and housing. Ideally, the latter, that is infrastructure and housing, would be such that it could mitigate and facilitate transitioning from the village lifestyle uh, and its mode of production, which was essentially uh, pastoralist or uh, 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 agriculture, to a lifestyle more suited to cities and industrial compounds, such as company towns. Uh, and, and this was, um, plenty of company towns were produced during this period. It was also about a class shift. Uh, of course, when your mode of production changes, there is a class shift too, but let, that's not the concern of my book or this presentation at this point. What I described just now which is, with some variations, well known in other contexts. It points to the inextricable, but at times neglected, link between culture and development. I've tried to show this in, in the diagram that you see here. In simple terms, under capitalist models of growth, and Iran was no doubt one of those, and it still is if you consider the neglect, ignore the zero growth that it's had for the past few years, development was induced by a set of pragmatic, technocratic, and policy-oriented concerns and programs. In developmental contexts such as Iran, this was heavily geared toward modernization plans, which initially at least subscribed to Western precepts. The result was an inevitable cultural change, and with it, various forms of nostalgia at multiple levels within the society. Here I'm drawing attention to the cultural work that development does, that this cultural work has memory related components, especially at the collective level, and it engages perceptions and conceptions of the past. As we shall see, it is through this that development relates to culture and via that to heritage. So um, that's what I'm trying to show in this kind of complex loop of relationships that you can see on the screen right now, that how uh, these uh, triad of policy oriented technocratic stuff relates to development and modernization, which induces cultural change, but it's also related to traditional culture. And so therefore it circulates around. In Iran, one could trace this relationship to the early decades of the 20th century. Although the formative period for this process and the concomitant concerns for identity and tradition was between the 1960s when the economic plans begin to yield results and 1980 with its repercussions in some areas apparent until the 2000s. As I alluded in an earlier slide, this is a period in which we witness two revolutions, the white revolution of the Pahlavis in 1963 and the Islamic revolution of 1979. And you can see there's a lot that's happening in between here uh, uh, in this uh, time period, compressed. There is a logical step from recognizing the development cultural relationship to positing, uh, sorry, that wasn't me. <laughs> uh, to positing the triad or nexus of development, built environment, heritage, which I'm portraying here. And here I'm speaking to this particular nexus. But how do we characterize culture and development in such a context? I suggest following anthropologist Anat Singh, <clears throat> excuse me, that culture is highly malleable and constantly reproduced. It is made through various encounters at different scales. Development is a globalizing and universalizing project which manifests differently and unpredictably in different contexts. This variation in manifestation is indeed the product of its universalizing qualities. This process of a universal engaging in particular contexts resulting in diverse outcomes, Singh identifies as friction. Now, what does this mean? Broadly, it means that universalizing projects result in particular unpredictable outcomes in various localities. So there is no such thing 
what I'm pointing out following thing here is not res it's not resistance that's happening. It's a different process that's going on here. There is a te specific temporal aspect too. As development unfolds in place, it also prompts temporal displacements, uh, followed by a renewed assessment of the past and its traditions. So when, when you're displaced, you look back, you reassess things. An important byproduct of this process is heritage, which, as I mentioned, means the use of the past, real or imagined, for the purposes of the present and as a roadmap to possible futures. Thus understood, heritage is inextricably linked to historical change and development, and as such, to borrow from Singh, it is an engaged universal. That's essentially what I'm trying to show in this diagram, that how the cogs start rotating around as, as things are shifted. But why look at the built environment and architecture in particular, which is the topic of this book or the driver or case of argument for this book? The answer is that because it embodies modes of habitation, situates social experience and reflects technological norms, architecture makes for an interesting register for heritage development relationship. Indeed, I go further and propose that heritage in the built environment is created through intentional practices of design where the past is reimagined and incorporated in concrete forms. And as you can see, these are uh, various examples of uh, old and new architecture that are happening. And, and they, they kind of try to speak to one another. And sometimes the, the speech is gibberish though. Anyway, that happens everywhere, I think. Um, focusing on the built environment as a fundamental facet of development, we can illustrate how the circumstances of this period uh, from the 1960s onward relate to the emergence of a heritage that was actively pursued through design and how and where this has changed after the 1979 revolution. This period involves major international exchanges, a focus on the question of housing, especially culturally appropriate housing, and a search for official expressions of collective identity. I will spend most of my remaining time on exchanges as the fundamental driver of change in and in the end, I will show you a couple of examples of the projects that ensued. So, so the, the, the kind of yellow top boxes that you can see over there, that's what I'm going to uh, try and uh, elaborate here. Uh, the book contains all of them, by the way. Um, the period between 1963, after the White Revolution referendum, and 1980, uh, the immediate aftermath of the Islamic Revolution is marked by an increase in various state-sponsored projects. These projects were mostly established as joint ventures between Iranians and their international counterparts. In an environment where rapid change had already unsettled assumptions about history, culture, and identity. So that's, that's how, how things are happening. These projects are, are, are commissioned just as change is taking place. So on the one hand, a new generation of foreign trained architects and academics were returning and bringing with them their networks, affiliations, as well as um, theories and ideas that absorb in Western universities. On the other hand, the Iranian establishment was becoming increasingly aware of the cultural schisms and problems that the society faced because of development. And this manifested in a stronger attention to Iranian and Islamic identity and traditions. Concurrently, there was a rising tide of third worldism, this is within and beyond Iran, and nativism amongst the intelligentsia. Earlier, the post-war Europe had faced a comparable condition in terms of the reconstruction and development projects, uh, population movements, and the concomitant cultural problems. And this particular experience made some European expertise relevant to the Iranian conditions. Now, two things that I need to elaborate on here. Number one, when I said that these foreign trade trained rather people came back, sometimes these uh, foreign trade trained people were actually married to colleagues from foreign countries. So we have a partnership at every level that's happening. Uh, uh, on the other level, and I'll, I'll deal with this, this question of cultural schism and, and trying to speak to some kind of some form of common ground is important to bear in mind, and I'll get to that in, in the coming slides. 
In this context, and drawing on foreign and Iranian expertise, there were many forms of exchange in industrial, cultural, and social arenas. A particular interest are three architectural congresses uh, that were held between 1970 and 76 with a clear agenda of examining regional and national identities, as you can see in the slide, uh, developing versus developed economies, and differential rates of modernization. These congresses consolidated the momentum that was appearing on the ground in relation to architecture, Iranian identity, and traditions. So uh, note, it's noteworthy that these congresses also took place in culturally significant places like historical sites and heritage sites or near those sites. Through encounters between various participants and architectural and by extension, cultural heritage was produced, one that could presumably uh, form or strengthen a cultural common ground between experts, the people and the state. After all, rapid change and displacement was already stretching and diluting that common ground. Now, uh, I'm working with this idea of a common cultural ground uh, inspired by or learning from uh, Hersfeld, Michael Hersfeld, the anthropologist. And uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a central point that any state, uh, in order to maintain a meaningful relationship with people, has to cultivate and attend to a common cultural ground. Sometimes that takes sinister forms, but it doesn't have to. I mean, it's not always that the state is bad full stop. I'm just trying to point out that this common ground was a concern for the Iranian state at the time. And, and they were trying to cultivate it or see what they can do with it through this rapidly changing times. This paved the ground for the birth of a heritage. Although the terminology that framed the concept as we know it today, and I'm nowadays referring to it, didn't exist as yet. The inaugural Congress in 1970 was opened by the Queen, uh, the elegant lady sitting there, emphasizing the ancient heritage of Iran and the need, and, and, and I've quoted her there, and the need to, and I quote, reconcile traditions with rapid advances. Signaling a de facto move from tradition to heritage, this Congress developed into a vibrant forum for exchanges of ideas, uh, where Iranians and their foreign counterparts divided into three main camps, in their approach to traditions. And these three have political repercussions as well, as I'm about to point out. Some overemphasize the Islamic aspect, insisting on universal immutability of traditions. And these are people like Sayyid Hossein Nasr, and, and uh, Nasr's son is now, or was, uh, a, a consultant to, uh, an advisor to the Obama government. So there's, it's at that level of uh, idea. Uh, it's a kind of a traditionalist ideology. Others advocated a nuanced interpretation and appropriation of traditions. This is the majority camp, essentially, how can we use tradition towards something else? And a third group uh, suggested that traditions had been unmoored and heritage of cities was weakened. And some, these are radical modernists, and some within this latter group thought that under the circumstances, uh, clinging on to traditions would be just an irrational act. So let go of everything. This sounds like in line with modernization theory by Lerner and others. The discussions in Congresses reveal an official effort for grappling with the entanglements presented by development. This is apparent in the key points discussed in the three Congresses, which included, and I've cited them over there, a focus on the relationship between tradition and technology, along with advocating a search for local identity a concern for globalizing Iran's culture and engaging it with modernization. So it's not just from outside in, but the cultural move or the, 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 the gaze is turning from inside out too. Workshopping new ideas, especially toward practical solutions. After all, development is done through practice. A growing attention to folk art and architecture in line with a similar trend in the West, I might add. And finally, uh, positing traditional architecture and cities as models for emulation in new culturally appropriate designs. You'd be surprised to know how many PhD proposals I still have seen and see to this day coming from, for example, Saudi Arabia or around the Persian Gulf that address the same topic. In seeking answers to questions such as the culture development relationship, paying attention to locality and searching for practical solutions, these Congresses foreshadowed 
debates that were formulated and theorized around two decades later. But these were first and foremost, a response to immediate problems. Underlying all of these was a search for an authentic expression of tradition through tropes such as the village, the idea that the village represents the rootedness. Here, the authentic is broadly understood uh, from environmental response and use of appropriate materials to engagement with historical roots of modern society. So from the very mundane to the very theoretical and esoteric, it contains all of those. Iranians mostly dismissed earlier modernist projects and programs in favor of a romantic nostalgic turn to the vernacular. This was in part a nationalist project attempting to find organic roots for civilizational claims within and beyond Iran proper. Now, just as an aside, you might be interested to know that it is uh, around this time, 72, 73, that Edward Said has taken up a position, uh, a visiting uh, fellowship, uh, Guggenheim Fellowship in uh, the American University of Beirut. And right at this time, he's traveling to Iran and seeing uh, Isfahan and Persepolis, the cities where these places were held as well. So the ideas of post-colonialism are beginning to kind of uh, gel and come out at the same time. So it's in, this, in the space, in the atmosphere. In the attempt to cope with an unpredictable future, the Congresses encouraged a search for new material in the past, invoking them to inform the design of appropriate architecture through which cultural problems associated with development might be ameliorated or overcome. Through these selective productions, reproductions rather of the past, an Iranian heritage was imagined and popularized through architecture. These encounters had repercussions inside Iran and abroad. Within Ali, we cannot hear you. It's frozen, I think. It was only a matter of time before Tehran Iran. packed in. Hello? Yes, we can hear you now, but your screen sharing went away. Oh, you, you, so you can't see the screen? No. Oh. We can see you, but you are not sharing the screen anymore. Uh, I promise I will share it. Here you go. I don't know what happened. Okay. Yeah, it's come back. You can see. Okay. Which, which one did you not see? Yeah. Hang on. No. Yes, this one. Yeah, you were at that one. Yeah. Okay. So I said within Iran, experimental projects were made which have nowadays become interesting sites of social and architectural research in their own right. The Congress debates and these projects also left a lasting impression on the practice and education of architecture and urbanism in Iran, continuing well after the revolution of 1979. The example you see here is called Shushtar No, the new town of Shushtar. It's a project uh, of new town initially dedicated to workers of Karun agri-industrial compound in Southern Iran but subsequently taking on residents, including war refugees because of the change of circumstances and the war between Iran and Iraq. Now, the point about this one is that uh, you can see every expression of what could look like a quote unquote Islamic architecture, what could look like a vernacular in the colors, in the material, in the little courtyards that you can see, the streets, everything else. Although uh, you can't actually pinpoint it to anything. It doesn't look like anything. Like it's not, a, it's not an exact copy. Uh, it, it, it's reproduced an atmosphere, but also uh, uh, the other side of it is that it is not uh, redeveloping a village. It is not redeveloping just a town. It is a company town. It works with uh, an agro-industrial compound. So this reference is actually sitting within the developmental project. It is not just an urban design project. That's the important point to bear in mind. While the architect had to flee the Islamic Republic for fear of uh, persecution, and by that I mean he would have been most likely shot because he was the cousin of the queen, the project uh, won a prestigious Al Khan Award for, the Islamic, for Islamic architecture as an exemplary cultural Islamic habitat uh, in their 1984-86 cycle. The problem of the culturally appropriate housing and the politics of heritage that sustain it 
persisted without a significant solution after the revolution and continue to this day. For those of you who might be interested, these are just uh, exact, this is exactly the same space photographed in two different times, as you can see up there in 1980s and 2010s. It's exactly the same house, as you can see, uh, economic pressures and also the pressures of life and comfort have changed the face of this thing. What used to be originally uh, pedestrian uh, piazzas, if you like, the Italian style inspired uh, pedestrian spaces is now uh, 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 different because it needs cars in. And therefore, because we have cars, because it's a valuable asset, we need garages and that, that has changed things. We need uh, to have more income. Therefore, we have staircases to built up rooms that weren't there initially to rent out. And we've also got air conditioning because it's too hot. So just, just pointing out how things have changed as, an, a, natural, uh, as, an, uh, as a natural progression of life. Um, at the same time, a strand of public architecture with an Iranian bent that had started before these debates was invigorated by them. The famous monument, Shahyad Azadi, that you can see here, it's Iran and Tehran are known because of it uh, or by it, is a testament to the production of heritage uh, through design in a process of collaboration between an Iranian architect and a foreign engineering firm, old Arab, and applying what was at the time cutting edge computer aided production technology. Here we can see the global movements of ideas and techniques, the global in this building engages with the local and produces a particular language that invokes memories of a past, but also produces memories in due course. And I'm about to explain in a second. In a way, this and other structures like it, these public monuments embody a future's past, one that is made relationally and shifts with scale. In our research, this was evident in the reactions of various groups of people we interviewed. Now, let me explain this. Uh, Ove Arab is the firm that, of course, has done the, uh, the Opera House in Sydney. This building precedes that. Uh, and these were uh, every piece of stone that you see in the facade has to be cut by computer aided design. And of course, Iran didn't have the technology. Ove Arab uh, managed to do that. So this is, this is a complete exchange between this, uh, the Iranians and their counterparts that produces this stuff. There are photographs of this with camels around the, the area. Uh, in shifting, you know, dirt and stuff like that. So that was the technology around when this was being also built. Um, but at the same time, this has produced its own memories because of its iconic view. It's been associated with various things, including various phases of revolution and protests against revolution. And that has produced its own memories as well. But at the same time, uh, its meaning changes depending on scale. We did thorough uh, uh, photo elicitations uh, between people around this monument within the capital and the provinces. And the results were very interesting how people read it differently depending on scale. So, but for that, you've got to go to the book. But we must remember that ideas, methods, know-how are in circulation and the flow of things is not just from an imagined global to a presumed local, as I've previously noted. Hence, the events in Iran add international repercussions also. In addition to informing overseas discussions and making Iran a testing ground for ideas, which is what these things did, the Congress debates led to the Habitat Bill of Rights presented by the Iran delegates uh, to the inaugural UN Conference on Human Settlements in Vancouver in 1976. These conference series are still ongoing. And this formed the impetus for the ongoing uh, UN Habitat Conferences. They also consolidated the idea of an intrinsically Islamic heritage by emphasizing notions of belonging to a place and a rejection of globalization, ideas that played out during or made sense during the Cold War era. Now, uh, the, this whole label, problematic label of Islamic architecture, that's partly playing into that too. As in many other spheres, the advent of the Islamic revolution dealt a blow to the status quo. The Islamic Republic caused what may, may be described as a flatter, flattening rather, of heritage. Ideological overemphasis on Islamic identity, coupled with anti-Westernism, initially resulted in trends that could be compared to Soviet socialist realist art. In the 1970s, skepticism of globality turned into a full rejection of global connections, which were then equated falsely, I might add, with the West. Here, the dialectic between tradition and heritage was rebooted as a mixture of religious heritage and strands of contemporary counter-enlightenment, Western thought came together 
to reimagine the past and its traditions. Heidegger looms large here. In the coming decade, there was a bifurcation in, uh, in expressions of heritage in the built environment. Figurative expressions of Islamic heritage, like iconic stuff, were served or reserved rather for public structures with a religious affiliation. And you can see one of them here. This is the um, Mosalla of Tehran, Mosalla meaning the prayer site. It's a massive site uh, and it's kind of like Sagrada Familia. They say that when Sagrada Familia finishes, the world will end. Will end. And this is pretty much the same thing. It's, it's almost ended, but it's never completely finished. As you can see in these pictures, it's massive and uh, everything happens in it. Um, from book fairs, to, uh, to massive religious rallies or Eids are held inside. But as you can see, it's an attempt to allude, make allusions to being Islamic with the minarets and the rest of it. In other areas such as housing, mind the contrast here, uh, but also in non-religious public buildings, there has been a palpable shift away from overt expressions of identity toward an acceptable, uh, so rather acceptance of Western styles. This has attracted criticism from the more conservative cor corners of the officialdom, clerical and layman alike. The new architecture, however, badly, increasingly speaks a universalist language. Uh, what I'm pointing out in these is that you can see that these are, these are no doubt, well, in my opinion, no doubt ugly, but that's the beauty of them is not the point. The point is that they are modern, quote unquote, they're contemporary. That's what I'm trying to say. There's very little religious or iconic invocations in these things. So what could this mean? The project of development is not finished, although it is stagnating for many different reasons, including the ineptitude and the vast and broad based corruption of the Islamic within the Islamic Republic. The culture development link, however, has taken a different course. For reasons of experience, economy, but also genuine lifestyle practices, the place of heritage and its architectural expression is now changed. The state has somewhat, somewhat abdicated its role in the production of an exclusive heritage, an inclusive rather, heritage. Heritage is a multifaceted process involving official and non-official players engaged in tran transnational networks. Perhaps this suggests that despite the ideological rhetoric, of being Islamic and everything being Islam, the state has failed or simply doesn't care to produce widely accepted cultural expressions. That is the common ground the Pahlavis desire, so desire. Consequently, heritage has been flattened into depthless signs in endless circulation on limited sites. Those sites being, as you can see in the picture here on the right, the mosques or religiously affiliated buildings. If anything, this exposes a failure of governance in broad, uh, in, in broad sense by the state of the Islamic Republic and is yet another unsettling expression of a growing state society gap inside Iran. Thank you very much. And for more, you can just see there. There you go. Thanks.